Today we continue in our study on the book of Esther. And we are arriving in chapter 6 of the book of Esther. And in chapter 6, we see on full display one of the most prideful men that are captured in Scripture. It is Haman. And we see the beginning, the unfolding, the path of destruction that pride leads to in the life of Haman. You see, pride is one of the most minimized, the most downplayed and justified sins. It's so easy for us to focus on all the other big sins that pride just kind of sneaks around and just kind of makes its way into your life. And you'll realize the path of destruction that it leads you on. Now, I'm not talking about the pride when you just have joy in your heart because your, your children did, you know, work so hard and persevered and, and won a national soccer championship. I'm not talking about that. That's good, right? That's good. I'm also not talking about when, when they, you know, when someone graduates and, and you just are filled with joy. You are filled with so much just gratitude for their hard work. I'm not talking about that. And I'm also not talking about when you leave to go to the store and you come home and you're so proud that the kids didn't shave the cat. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking. That's totally different. The pride I'm talking about is actually a sin. It is when we focus on self. It is when there is a self-elevation, self-promotion, Self-pursuit that places our wants, our needs, our will above others. There's an amazing author who went to be with the Lord and um, a theologian by the name of C.S. Lewis. And in his book, Mere Christianity, this is what he says about pride. He said, the utmost evil is pride. The utmost evil. Unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all of that are mere flea bites in comparison to pride. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. And again, the devil wants us to minimize it. Oh, it's okay to be selfish. It's okay to, to elevate yourself and put others down. It's okay to always think that you know better. It's okay. It's not as bad as that sin. And then what happens is the devil deceives us. And then all of a sudden, we are on a path that is apart from God. You see, the devil never wants us and never ask us to be his servants. Because all he has to do is get us to be selfish. And he's already got us. Selfishness. And pride is the root of all selfishness. Pride, what does pride look like? Again, pride looks like someone who thinks their way is better. Pride looks like someone knows better than others. Pride looks like someone who's always doing things to build themselves up. And the result is they judge others, focus on others' thoughts, um, focus on others' faults, focuses on others' failures as a way to elevate their actions or accomplishments. Pride in relationships and conversations goes back to the person. Because again, pride is... Self-elevation, self-promotion, self-pursuit. It focuses on what we've done and misses the accomplishments in celebrating what others have done. Also, pride is manifested in a person who cannot admit they're wrong. They can't take responsibility for their own actions. Now, I believe there are two things that fuel pride. One is just arrogance. 
where you think you know better. You think you are all that in a bag of chips. You are the bee's knees. You are always wanting people to look at you, right? There is an arrogance. There's another source of pride that truly comes from insecurity. And it's where you have been hurt. You have been vulnerable. You have been, again, hurt by what people have said or done. So you put up walls. You're not going to dare show any weakness. You're not going to dare show any vulnerability. It's really hard for you to trust people. So you put up these walls that look like pride or arrogance, but it's really insecurity. But either source, either one of those that fuels it, it is sin. And it is not who God has called us to be. And it leads to not only a path away from God, but a path to destruction. And it is the devil's secret weapon. It is his secret weapon. Because again, we minimize it. We elevate other sins into view when this sin causes so much destruction. The wisest man, Solomon, said this in Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction. I mean, that's a pretty big statement, okay? That's how serious this is. A haughty spirit before a fall. Haughty simply means high. Again, self-exaltation over another person. Thinking of yourself too highly. Focusing on yourself. Meeting your needs. Looking out for number one, yourself. Leads to destruction and leads to a fall. And in scripture, there is not a clearer picture of someone who really captures this whole sin to the fullest extent than with Haman in the events of Esther's life. And what I'd like to do is, before we get into chapter 6, I'd like to look at the end of chapter 5, which shows Haman's pride on full display. Now, this is after the first banquet that Esther invi invites King Xerxes and Haman to this banquet. Haman's leaving feeling really good about himself. And this is what is captured in verses 10 through 14 of Esther 5. Calling together his friends and Zeresh, his wife, Haman boasted to them about his vast wealth, his many sons, and all the ways the king had honored him and how he had elevated him above the other nobles and officials. And that's not all Haman added. I'm the only person Queen Esther invited to accompany the king to the banquet she gave. And she has invited me along with the king tomorrow. But all this gives me no satisfaction as long as I see that Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. His wife Zeresh and all of his friends said to him, Have a gallows built 75 feet high and ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai hanged on it. Then go with the king to the dinner and be happy. This suggestion delighted Haman, and he had the gallows built. I mean, you talk about a quick period of time that this is built. This is all built before the next morning, 75 feet high, a gallows that he's going to ask the king to have Mordecai hung on it so that he can go to the banquet that evening in a good mood. I mean, that's the type of person that we see here. But as we've seen throughout the book of Esther, even though God's name is not mentioned, God is in control. God is working. Because Haman's plan was for Mordecai to die, and then he goes to the banquet. Well, God had another plan. Because the reality is there are no coincidences with God. We see what happens as Haman's fall begins to take place. He begins to unravel at the beginning of chapter 6. And it happens with the king having a sleepless night. Now, we have all had sleepless nights, right? But God was in control, and God used this. God was orchestrating it so that Mordecai would be honored 
instead of Haman. Let's see this unfold in Esther chapter 6, 1 through 14. Esther chapter 6, 1 through 14. That night the king could not sleep, so he ordered the book of the Chronicles, the record of his reign, to be brought in and read to him. It was found recorded there that Mordecai had exposed Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, who had conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. What honor and recognition has Mordecai received for this, the king asked. Nothing has been done for him. His attendants answered. The king said, who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the court of the palace to speak to the king about hanging Mordecai on the gallows he had erected for him. His attendants answered, Haman is standing in the court. Bring him in, the king ordered. When Haman entered, the king asked him, what should be done for the man the king delights to honor? I love this. This is how prideful he is. Now Haman thought to himself, who is there that the king would rather honor than me? So he answered the king, for the man the king delights to honor, have them bring a royal robe the king has worn and a horse the king has ridden, one with a royal crest placed on its head. Then the robe and the horse be entrusted to one of the king's noble princes. Let the, them robe the man the king delights to, to honor and lead him on a horse throughout the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. Again, he's all thinking, this is for me. I'm going to come up with the most elaborate scene so I can be honored. And then the king responds. Go at once, the king commanded Haman. Get the robe and the horse and do just as you suggested for Mordecai, the Jew who sits at the king's gate. Do not neglect anything you have recommended. So Haman got the robe and the horse. He robed Mordecai and led him on horseback through the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. Afterward, Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman rushed home with his head covered in grief and told Zeresh, his wife, and all of his friends everything that happened to him. His advisors and his wife Zeresh said to him, since Mordecai, before whom your downfall had started, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. While they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried Haman away to the banquet Esther had prepared. I mean, you can't tell me God does not have a sense of humor. That's hilarious. I mean, it really is. Here he is, do all of this, you know, and, and thinking all for me. And then it's the person he hates, and he is the one that has to parade him through the streets. I mean, if I was Mordecai, I'd be like, hey, hey, man, they can't hear you louder, you know. I mean, this is totally a turn of events. This is the beginning of the fall. Because pride elevates ourselves. And ultimately, pride separates us from God because we are focused on us being exalted and not God. And that always results in a fall. I mean, a lot of you watch football and you see these athletes and they catch the ball and they're going for the end zone and they're totally, you know, eh, and somebody comes up and knocks it out the last second. I love that. That is pride going before a fall. I remember one time, Jane and I were first married as before kids, and we were at a church in Cincinnati, and it was some night, I don't know what we were doing, but there were some of us singing. There was nobody in there. We were just singing, a guy playing the guitar, and there was a song by this band called Delirious. I just loved the song, and I had the harmony part, I mean, to a T. And this guy and I are on the microphone. There's a girl behind me, and she had a microphone, and I am just singing that harmony part like no one has ever sang that harmony part. And I look over and Jane and, and one of her friends were looking and they were kind of, you know, getting my attention and stuff. And I'm, and I'm like, okay, you won it. So I'm singing even louder, you know, closing my eyes, all this kind of stuff. And I look over again to see them, you know, waving and giving the thumbs up. And they're like, no, no. 
They were pointing to the girl behind me so I could shut up so she could sing. And I'm just like, oh, I feel, you know, it's that thing where pride all of a sudden just puffs you up and you miss everything else around you. Pride goes before a fall. Pride goes before destruction. And what happens next with Haman? We see at the end of that, Haman is rushed off to this banquet. He doesn't feel very good about himself because he didn't get the boost he wanted by killing Mordecai. Instead, he paraded him through the streets. And now he goes to the second banquet we'll look at next week, where actually his plan, his plot to kill all the Jews, including Esther that he doesn't realize yet, and then it will lead to Haman's death on those gallows, not Mordecai. Pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit goes before a fall. As Christians in the church, what can we learn? What can we learn from this? What are things that we need to understand about pride? Because again, we minimize it. We minimize it. We water it down. And we do not see the true path that it leads. So let's look at a couple things. The first is this. Pride goes before destruction because pride opposes people. When we are focused on ourselves and it's all about everybody, see what I can do. It's all about look at me, look at this. When it's all about us, we are actually opposing people. We are hurting relationships. Making it it about us is missing God's heart, which we are to make our lives about others. See, pride keeps us from seeing other people, just like me standing up there, belting out those harmony parts. I didn't even see the person behind me that needed the encouragement, and I needed to shut my face so she could be encouraged. We don't see others when it's about us. It makes us bigger and makes other people smaller. Pride keeps us, again, from admitting our wrongs. It keeps us from admitting our weaknesses, and it keeps us from forgiving others because we can't take responsibility. A proud person surrounds himself with people who agree with him. More importantly, they surround themselves with people who don't disagree with them proud person, it's hard for them to listen to others, see others, and love others. And many times when they do listen, when they do see other people, when they do love other people, it's in an effort for it to then come back around to them. And this is sneaky stuff the devil does. I have been on paths of pride multiple times in my life, not even knowing it. But if we just realize That pride ultimately takes us away from seeing, serving, and loving other people. We can see with clear view that pride, it's all about us. It's all about us. And pride hurts relationships. The Apostle Paul talks to several churches in his letters on this issue of pride. Because pride manifested in the church comes out as judgment, comes out as self-righteousness, comes out as legalism, comes out as, again, judging other people. It is so dangerous to the church, and it destroys the unity of the body of Christ when people are all about themselves. And so Paul in Romans 12, 16 says this. He says, live in harmony with one another. Live in harmony, in unison with one another. And then he says, do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. My favorite is what Paul wrote in Philippians 2, 3 through 5. And let's be honest, this is hard. We're in such a culture today that's all about take care of yourself first. It's all about if you don't take care of yourself, no one else will. Survival. That's the whole thing of when we're insecure and we build up walls. We're really just trying to protect ourselves, but we're keeping other people out. But this is what Paul says. This is what the church should look like in Philippians 2, 3 through 5. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. 
Thinking of others is better than yourselves. Don't look out for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Jesus gave his life. He lived humbly, sacrificially, selflessly. And Jesus gives the command to the church in John 13, 34 through 35. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The last thing we need to understand, and, and most importantly, that we need to understand about pride is this. Pride goes before destruction because God opposes the proud. Pride is a sin. Selfishness is a sin. Looking at your own interest and your own gain is sin. And God opposes the proud because pride is a sin and it puts us in an elevated place instead of God, a place that he deserves. In the New Testament book of James, James writes that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. The Greek word that James used for opposed is the Greek word antitasso. Antitasso means to be in battle against or be at war with. This is how seriously God takes selfishness, pride, arrogance, seeking your own interests. James says that when we are prideful, God opposes us. What that means is we cross the enemy lines to where the devil is working instead of where God is working. We step outside of grace. We rely on ourselves, make it about us, and we stand in a place where God is now battling against us. And I don't know about you, I can't have God against me. I need God. We need God. And to be in that place where we are prideful means God is withholding his grace from us. And grace is God giving us what we don't deserve, doing for us what we can't do. Pride is a place where we separate ourselves from God because it's all about me. And as soon as we do that, we take our view off of what Christ has done for us. Because our life should be that Jesus is elevated. Jesus is first. Jesus is the most important thing in my life. And everything I do is in response to what Jesus has done. We live in shadow of the cross. Everything is in that context. But pride takes us away from Jesus being elevated and elevates ourselves. And it's at that point that God draws the line. Nope, you're not going to do that to Jesus. God draws the line and says, I'm going to make you feel the weight of not having my grace. So you will repent and you'll come back to me. Pride is a serious sin against God and against our Savior and Lord. And God does not take it lightly, and neither should we. Now, I'd like to give uh, some helpful tools here for us. Because for me, I was thinking, okay, because the devil is so sneaky with pride, and so many times we don't even realize we're being prideful, so many times we don't realize we're putting up walls to protect ourselves emotionally, so many times we don't realize that we're going down this path and now we've crossed lines and God is in opposition to us. So many times we don't realize it. So what can we do to help realize when we are beginning to step into a self-exaltation and elevation? And I found this article, and I love, I love the, the title of it. It says, How to Be Perfectly Miserable. Okay? How to Be Perfectly Miserable. And it gives ten things... That will lead to a miserable life. And ultimately, these 10 things reveal signs or red flags that pride has made its way into your thinking, made its way into your heart. 
And if any of these are things that you struggle with, please, please pray and say, God, may I come to the end of myself. May it be through your spirit and through your son that I am changed and my life is 100% about you. God gives grace to the humble, okay? Here's the 10 things. Again, how to be perfectly miserable. These are signs that pride has a place in your life. The first is, think about yourself. Think about yourself. When you start your day and all you're doing is thinking, wow, how can I be happy today? How can I take care of myself? And you don't think about other people. That is a sign that pride has made its way in. The second is talk about yourself. If you talk to people and you realize that every conversation goes back to you, what you've done, the things going on in your life. The third is this, insist on consideration and respect. It's not about earning it. It's not about honor. It's about insisting. That is a place where pride has come in. Fourth, demand agreement with your own views on everything. You see, when we step out of God's grace, we don't offer grace to other people, and we become judgmental, and we demand agreement with our views. That means pride has taken place. Number five, never forget a service you have rendered. It's in your own mind. You have this wall of all your awards of everything you've ever done. Oh, I did all these things for this person. And then where love does not keep record of wrong, pride keeps record of rights. And it is all about what we've done. And we never forget a service we have rendered. Six, we expect to be appreciated. Seven, we are suspicious. We're always on guard. Eight, we are sensitive to slights. Again, because grace is gone, we're separate from God's grace, we are super sensitive to everything anybody says that might offend us. Nine, jealous and envious. And ten, we never forget criticism. Again, it's an absence of grace. It's an absence of forgiveness. It's an absence of being able to pursue reconciliation. So Jesus is the center of the relationship. It is everything we do goes back to us. And that is not what God has called his people to. And that will lead to a miserable life. You won't admit it because you're prideful. But it's a miserable life. Because it's ultimately a life in which Jesus has been pushed to the side. And we've been elevated to a place a priority. Now, again, I'm not saying this with a pointed finger without knowing that these are areas that I can so easily fall into. And I have to be so aware, and so many times for me personally, it's because I've been hurt. So I put up these walls. I can't admit I'm wrong because if I admit I'm wrong, then I'm susceptible to being hurt again. And it's all about me. It's all about me. We are not king of kings and lord of lords. We are not the son of God, the perfect savior. There is only one. His name is Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. And when we truly die to ourself is when we truly live in the victory of Christ. That is what we're called. That's what we're called to. So our question is, are we going to be like Haman? If it was all about him. Are we going to be like Mordecai? I'd like to close with this. Mordecai, after he was paraded through the streets, he didn't stand there and rub it in Haman's face. He didn't go to the palace and say, this is where I belong now, you know. He didn't get out his rings and his bling bling, you know. No, it says in verse 12, after Mordecai returned, he went to the king's gate. He went back to service. It wasn't about him. It was about humble service. He trusted God it was not about his gain or promotion. It was all about God's will and God's work in his life. And because of that, God's grace moved. And as we'll see next week, God saved his people. So, where are you at today? Where is God wanting to work in your life? More importantly, is God opposing you today because of pride? Or is God pouring out his grace?
At this time, I'd like to invite the worship team up, and as they're coming up, I'm just going to pray and give an opportunity for us to respond, give an opportunity for us to be able to lift our eyes to Jesus Christ, for us to be able to see everything we are in context of the cross. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. Thank you, God, for your grace, your grace that not only receives us, your grace that leads to forgiveness, your grace that leads to salvation, but God, thank you for your grace that we can live every day making it not about us because grace is where we realize and surrender to the fact that we need you for everything. We don't deserve anything. It is all about you and what you have done what you are doing and what you will do through Jesus Christ and through the indwelling of your Holy Spirit. So God, I pray that if there is anyone here that struggles with selfishness, anyone here that struggles with pride, that God, your spirit will convict them and you will open up their eyes and increase their faith to realize that they desperately need you. And God, forgive us of the times that we have allowed pride to come in whether it's arrogance or self-defense, ultimately it's rejecting you, God, because we make it about us. God, may we realize how serious the sin of pride is. And God, may we humbly seek you. May we repent and turn back to you and into everything set our eyes, our life, our heart, our faith, our pursuit on the cornerstone, the one that holds it all together, Jesus Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.